Snow in Britain? In winter? The internet, of course, is awash with theories about how and why this unprecedented event is happening. Now, I hope you all know me well enough by now to know that the first thing I do when confronted with internet hysteria is, that's right, track the information back to its source. Most internet sites quote other internet sites that quote other internet sites. It's the electronic adult equivalent of schoolyard gossip. But when we follow the trail right back, we find that all these assertions come from just one source, a theoretical physicist called Gianluigi Zangari. In July, he published a paper on the website of something called the Geophysical Association of Italy. Out of the hundreds of scientific papers I've read in my professional career, this has to be one of the shortest and most amateurish outside of creationist literature. It would be laughable to even presume it was peer-reviewed. It's so brief, I can sum it up very quickly. Zangari looked at satellite images and concluded that the loop current in the Gulf Stream must have slowed down. Since observations have shown us that sea currents often speed up or slow down, is this anything unusual in the Gulf? Has it happened before? Is it part of a cycle? Zangari doesn't spend any time finding that out. He's already moved on, and the rest of the paper consists of conjecture, possibilities, and armchair speculation. It might be plausible, he writes, that the BP oil spill caused this slowdown, and that it's reasonable to foresee instabilities which in turn may interrupt the global climate. What evidence is there for any of this? None. It's just Zangari's ponderings. But the Chinese whispers of the internet playground turn these plausibles and maybes into alarming certainties about how scientists have discovered a disruption of the global climate. There's even a YouTube guru who calls himself the Earl of Sterling spreading this alarmist crap. I call this alarmist because this is the correct definition of the term alarmist. We're not dealing with research published in respected peer-reviewed journals, warning of earthquakes, health risks and climate change and backed by solid evidence. These are people who make up scary predictions based on exaggerations or an active imagination. In a radio interview, the Earl said this. But then he said, have you got uh, confirmation from Noah? A good question. What does Noah think of your ideas? I mean, it would be good to have some actual science-based confirmation in the way of published research. As I've said before, we don't research something as complex as the global climate just by looking out the window to see what the weather's like. And I said, with all due respect, if you want confirmation, look outside the window. Ah, if that's the best you can come up with, we don't need to waste any more time on your theory. Let's move on to the other extreme of this so-called debate, the carefully formulated theory called It's snowing outside so the world can't be warming. Every time winter comes around, whether it's a blizzard in New York or a snow flurry in London, you can bet that someone will say, whatever happened to global warming? I thought these so-called scientists had decreed that the UK would have no more snow and that the climate would resemble the south of France, said one post in the Daily Mail. Scientists were saying there would be no more snow in Britain? When was this piece of research published? I tried to keep up with the scientific journals, but obviously I missed this one, so once again let's track this down to a source. It didn't take long to discover that this didn't come from any scientific research, but a story in Britain's independent newspaper ten years ago titled Snowfalls are now just a thing of the past. And where did the independent get this nonsense from? Well, I'll come to that in a minute, but first let's check the independent's claim. Now, it's labelled environment, and it's supposed to be about weather patterns and climate, which means it's a science story. But the author was someone called Charles Onyens, who, no surprise for guessing, is not a science journalist. No kidding, what I'm about to read you comes verbatim from the story. Cue teary music and a silly voiceover. Sledges, snowmen, snowballs, and the excitement of waking to find that the stuff has settled outside are all a rapidly diminishing part of Britain's culture. A generation was growing up without experiencing one of the great joys and privileges of living in this part of the world, open-air skating. The chances are certainly now stacked against the sort of heavy snowfall in cities that inspired Impressionist painters such as Sisley and the 19th century poet laureate Robert Bridges, who wrote in London's snow of it, stealthily and perpetually settling and loosely lying. Not any more, it seems.
I'll cut before I throw up. As I said in my last video, too often the media seem to think stories about the environment are touchy-feely human interest pieces rather than science. So instead of assigning the snow-free Britain story to a science journalist who might have determined that it was crap, they give it to a journalist who apparently specialises in human rights issues. And instead of citing scientific studies and peer-reviewed research papers, Onions gives us quotes from Hamley's Toy Store, the Fenland Indoor Speed Skating Club, a local historian, an anthropologist, and, oh yes, a scientist, Dr David Viner of the Climatic Research Unit. No research was cited in support of it, including Viner's. Someone wrote to me saying Viner should issue a retraction. Yes, I'd like him to go even further, a retraction and an explanation. But Viner has been surprisingly silent on this ever since snowmen, sledges and snowballs unexpectedly appeared on his doorstep last November. I wrote to him through the British Council, where he now works, and got this rather lame reply, filtered through the British Council's Public Relations Department. Over the past decade, climate science has moved on considerably, and there is now more understanding about the impact climate change will have on weather patterns in the coming years. It has indeed moved on but not to the extent that ten years ago researchers thought snow would be a rarity within a few years, and within a few years they completely changed their minds. I can't find anything in the scientific literature ten years ago that supports Viner's statement, and his unwillingness to defend the rare snow idea by citing any can only lead to the conclusion that there isn't any. Apart from Viner, Onions refers to only one other scientist, but doesn't quote him at all. Onions writes, David Parker at the Hadley Centre for Climate Prediction and Research in Berkshire says, ultimately, British children could have only virtual experience of snow. No timescale is given. Ultimately could mean 100 or 150 years from now. As well as an explanation from Viner, I think we also deserve an explanation from The Independent. If this is supposed to be science news, why was a science reporter not assigned? Why wasn't a single scientific paper cited in support of the story's premise? Why wasn't it corroborated by climatologists who are actually doing research into European weather patterns? Because the independence claim bears no relation to anything in the scientific literature at the time, and it's the scientific literature that represents our knowledge of science, not quotes in the popular press. If Onions or his editor had bothered to check, they would have found a wealth of research on European weather patterns, none of which predicted an end to sledges, Jeez. snowmen, snowmen, snowballs, and the excitement of waking to find... All right, all right, I've just had lunch. A number of papers written in the late 1990s showed that warm and cold winters in northern Europe are cyclical and dependent on two atmospheric phenomena. One of them, the North Atlantic Oscillation, is characterized by a permanent state of high pressure over the Azores and low pressure over Iceland. If the difference is small, the NAO is said to be in a negative phase and northern European winters are cold. If the difference in pressure increases, the NAO goes into a positive phase and winters are warmer. The reason for this is that the difference in pressure drives westerly winds. 1947 and 1963 saw particularly cold winters in Britain, just like 2009 and 2010, and all of them coincided with negative phases of the North Atlantic Oscillation. The warm winters of the 1990s were associated with positive phases of the oscillation. In 1997, Hurrell and Van Loon wrote this in a paper published in Climate Change. Recent decadal changes in temperature and precipitation are related to pronounced changes over the past 20 years in the wintertime atmospheric circulation over the ocean basins of the Northern Hemisphere. So Onion's assertion that scientists are attributing warmer winters to global climate change was pure bunkum. Some scientists may have been, who knows, but climatologists who were actually doing the research were much more circumspect. The uncertainty at the time was neatly summed up in the same paper by Hurrell and Van Loon. Whether the observed changes are in response to greenhouse gas forcing or whether the changes are part of a natural decadal timescale variation is difficult to assess and is a matter of much debate. Whatever the influence of global warming, no published paper concluded that the North Atlantic Oscillation was dead and that cold winters would become a rarity in Britain within a few years. The second major influence is something called the Arctic Oscillation, which was also being researched in the late 1990s. According to Thompson and Wallace in a study published in 1998, 
the leading empirical orthogonal function of the wintertime sea level pressure field is more strongly coupled to surface air temperature fluctuations over the Eurasian continent than the North Atlantic Oscillation. In plain English, this means that a fluctuating weather pattern called the Arctic Oscillation has even more influence than the North Atlantic Oscillation. Researchers now believe that both are linked, working together to bring extreme warm and cold winters to northern Europe in cycles that run over several decades. As a science journalist rather than a climatologist, one of the ways I can determine the importance and influence of these papers is to see how many times they've been cited by other researchers. In other words, how many other studies use the results to help further their research. But the papers I've quoted have each been cited around a thousand times. It would have been impossible for the independent to have missed them. Of course, other factors can interrupt or exaggerate the effects of these natural cycles, the warming effect of carbon dioxide, the cooling effect of the solar cycle, and the cooling effect of particulates and aerosols. To that, we now have to add one more factor, the reduction in Arctic sea ice. A capping of sea ice tends to stop heat escaping from the ocean underneath. A recently published paper by Petakov and Semenov found that when there's less ice on the Barents and Kara Seas, the Arctic Ocean gives up heat and warms the troposphere. This forms an anticyclone, a high-pressure area over the Arctic that sends cold easterly winds across northern Europe. Before critics of climate science rush to their keyboards to tell me this is just a hurried and belated excuse to blame global warming for the severe winter weather, let me point out that this paper was submitted in November 2009. So the research was done before the severe winter of 2009-2010 and well before the severe weather Europe is currently experiencing in 2010-2011. One of the problems is that when people outside the field of science first became aware of global warming in the 1990s, they assumed that from that point on everything would start to get warmer. A headline in Britain's Sun newspaper, again not the best source of science news, predicted a Costa del Manchester. When Britons experienced the warm winters of the late 1990s, they assumed this was now the new climate. And so did a lot of journalists, it seems. There was also an assumption that global warming meant every part of the planet would get warmer. But that's not the case either, which is why the scientific term is climate change. So to the guy who wrote this post, and the people who persistently put these posts on my channel, scientists haven't recently been calling it climate change at all. The term has been in use for over a century, which is why we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The term global warming was a colloquialism coined in the late 1970s that specifically refers to rising average global temperatures. Petukov and Semenov's paper shows why the two terms shouldn't be confused. As the planet warms up, not every regional climate and every season will experience increases in temperature. By way of illustration, here's the temperature map of Europe showing the extreme below average temperatures in November 2010. But if we zoom out from that, we can see that the rest of the northern latitudes were experiencing above-average temperatures. So throughout this video series, I use the term climate change to mean climate change and global warming to mean global warming. If you think one term has replaced the other as part of a conspiracy to fool us, I suggest you find out the difference and see how they're used in the scientific literature. So why hasn't the climate models showed us that there would be snow in winters? Answer, climate models have shown us exactly that. Well, it's hardly surprising that people don't read the research that predicted the deep chill, preferring instead to read fluffy stories about children never knowing the joys of snow. One's hard, the other's easy. So now the no-snow myth joins the other myths attributed to scientists that they predicted global cooling in the 1970s and an ice age in the 1990s. You'll find debunks of these in my other videos. But the last laugh really has to go to poor old Charles Onions. Having given us the no more snow in winter story in The Independent ten years ago, he's recently been reporting for the Newswire AFP on, guess what, the paralysis at Charles de Gaulle Airport due to heavy snow. It could only be more ironic if he was reporting on British kids having fun with their toboggans.